what better time to check on the progression of the Sacramento Kings than during the All-Star break? It's like the progress report time of the school year. Have the Kings really progressed this season? Or completely different question. Have the Kings gotten closer to where head coach Mike Brown wants them to be? To address both those questions, plus De'Aaron Fox, DeMonta Sabonis, and so much more, Damian Barling, the D'Lo, and D'Lo and KC on ESPN 1320 joins me right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked on Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all season long. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News. And our city of Sacramento is blessed to have one of the best radio shows, not just, of course, in the city, not just in the state, in the entire country. D'Lo and KC on Monday through Friday, noon to four. They do an amazing job talking Kings basketball, do an amazing job talking 49ers football, all professional and local sports they cover it they're two great friends of mine and i'm thankful enough happy enough to have one of them damian barling who not only is a friend but has been a mentor of mine for many many years here in this industry uh, and in this city anytime that i can have d-low on it's a real treat we talk about a lot of stuff here including like i mentioned there in the intro and including what you're seeing uh, on the side of the screen everything from the progression of the sacramento kings to uh handling the the good and the bad of of De'Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis not getting the respect that he deserves around the NBA, the ultimate race for the uh the playoffs here in the Western Conference that's only going to heat up when we get out of the All-Star break. So much that we discuss, so please sit back, relax and enjoy my conversation with ESPN 1320's Damian Barling. I have a feeling we all needed this all-star break as much as the Sacramento Kings did. Damian Barling from ESPN 1320's D'Lo and KC joining me back here on the Locked on Kings podcast. The blessing and the curse of this time, D'Lo, is there's no Kings basketball, so we can all get a breather, but there's no Kings basketball. So what the hell do we (laughs) talk about type thing, especially here on a Kings dedicated podcast? It's like a mini offseason, but an offseason I feel that this Kings team desperately desperately needs not necessarily just for the rest element although that is important but also just kind of a a recharge and a gather up for what i expect is going to be an a, a just a chaotic race for the playoffs in the western conference just with the way that this conference is, is shaping up ultimately this is a position that you want this king's team to be in talk about testing themselves like here is the ultimate test well before the playoff begins which of course is the ultimate goal i'm going to start with this where is your confidence level at right now with this team's ability to not just make the playoffs. I'm talking about secure a top six seed because that felt like it wasn't a question a month and a half ago. Now there's a good chance that this team is a play-in team and has to earn that spot the hard way. Yeah. um, Wednesday afternoon, my confidence was trash. (laughs) For some reason, I was really, really frustrated by the Phoenix loss. Um, I know that they played well. They played really well. I think I was so dejected at the thought that Three guys scored like 90 something points and they mm. couldn't win. Like you scored a, mm. so, so, so you had, you, you, I think it was 40, 30, and 20 something, right? From Malik, Domas, De'Aaron. Like that's 90. You scored 125. You couldn't win that game. Mm. Like you couldn't close that game out and you lost Bradley Beal. You know, they lost Bradley Beal to it for some reason, more than the Pistons game, more than Hornets games, more than the Blazers, more than some of these frustrating losses that the Kings have had this year. For some reason, that Phoenix one really, really upset me, and my confidence was gone. I was like, this team's probably a playing team. And I think part of it was I I still have a lot of questions about them, but Dallas is playing really well right now, Mm -hmm. and they made some moves at the trade deadline to get better. Now, whether that works in the long term remains to be seen. The Lakers are playing well. The Warriors are playing really, really well right now. Uh, you got Phoenix, who's just kind of been in the same position most of the year, and then New Orleans, which to me is one of the more baffling teams in the Western Conference. I I, I just kind of felt like the Kings sunk. 
Mm-hmm. Like the Kings just kind of sunk below those teams. Then they beat Denver and I felt a little bit better. And I and I and I spent all of Wednesday saying it doesn't matter what happens tonight. Like I it it it's not gonna it's not gonna you know set some grand picture of what the future looks like or what the second part of the season looks like. It's just if they beat Denver, that's pretty crazy if they beat Denver a third straight time. But then they did it and I changed my mind and I was really excited they beat Denver. Part of the reason was because that night could have been really, really bad. Hmm. The Lakers won that night. Phoenix won that night. All of those teams that we just listed, Dallas, New Orleans, they all won. Every single one of them. So the Kings, they could have been entering this break half a game up on the Lakers and maybe a game and a half, given that they won a thriller last night over the Warriors had they not beat Denver. So I feel a little bit better than I did uh, on Wednesday afternoon, but I still have... I still have a lot of questions about what this team can do moving forward. Your frustration after the Suns game reminds me of the frustration that I had after the the Memphis game. Now, you're a little more justified because yours was a loss. Mine was a win. And a lot of Kings fans couldn't get on board with why I was so frustrated after that game. But I think every single Kings fan who's been following this team regularly and even media members, you listen to James Ham, you listen to Kyle Madsen, Kenny Carraway, everybody who watches this team regularly. There's been at least one game this season where we've all wanted to just pull our hair out in frustration. It's it's just, we know this team is better than this, but I'm curious where you think this, this kind of universal frustration comes from. Is it maybe we had too high of expectations for this team coming into this year, or is it just because we're all kind of in this new territory of this Kings team is good. We know they're good. We've been told it's hard to get to great, but even sustaining good at this point in the Western Conference doesn't feel like it's going to be good enough. Where do you feel like the the frustration for Kings fans with the the inconsistencies of this Kings team, or just where this Kings team is at? Still eight games above 500. They're a good basketball team, yeah. but the frustrations this year have sometimes felt worse than some of the years of the playoff drought. Yeah, I think I think you the the, the words you use the expectations. Like I I, I think we collectively whether it be media fans or mike brown De'Aaron fox i think we 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 used words we shouldn't have hmm. i think we all believe this team was good and hmm. maybe we believed if things really hit on sasha uh keegan really got that development we were hoping for they would be even better than they were last year and that's perfectly fair it's a perfectly fair thought but we started using the word contender And how could this team be a contender? This team could be a contender if they did this, this, and this. That's probably a stretch. And it's a little easier to recognize that in hindsight than it is in the moment when all of a sudden the entire region of Sacramento became EuroLeague basketball experts as Sasha Vazenkov uh, was going on this run over there that had, you know, Kings fans really excited. The other thing is the standings look different. Mm -hmm. And... You know, we had we were having a discussion, a, a, a pretty spirited discussion a couple of days ago with I think it was our show and James was on it. And we were talking about like measurements of the season and a regression. And, you know, if they, they're on pace to win 46 wins, that's a clear regression. Like, well, no, it's not like it's it's two games worse. And we can make all of the excuses we want to for the final three games of the season about how they had everything locked up and they mailed it in. We could do that. And that's perfectly fair. It's part of the story of last year's season where they were at 48 wins. They didn't need to win another game. They were secure there in the third spot and they kind of chose a certain direction the final week of the season. And that got them three more losses. But the fact is a 48 to 46, isn't that big of a deal. What people are looking at is the fact that they're on pace to win just about as many games as they did last year. But they're not the three seed, they're the eight seed. And it looks like, at least in the moment, Minnesota's like past you, right? Like Minnesota has finally. Now, there were people who would say last year, Minnesota was supposed to be better than you. It's taken Minnesota forever to get to this point. For some reason, they've got no heat for that, but it's taken them forever to get to this point. But salute to them. They're playing great basketball. They finally have. The jarring one is Oklahoma City. Right. Everybody knew Oklahoma City was going to be better. I'll speak for myself when I say I didn't know they were going to be this good. 
-hmm. and they're legit. Like they're, they're real. This isn't a fluke. This isn't, they're legit. Like they're Mm -hmm. a really, really good basketball team. And my thoughts of where they were, would be, wasn't two or one. Like it wasn't up there below 20 losses uh, before the all-star break. Uh, You've got the Clippers rolling, which is always kind of a question as to whether that's going to happen. You don't really know what Phoenix is, but they're up there right now. Dallas is constantly trying to make moves and get better. And then you got New Orleans. New Orleans is another team like Minnesota, who people have been saying for years, this is the one, this is the one, this is the one, this is the one, where they're finally kind of stringing it together. Though it's probably not exactly what what Pelicans fans hoped for. Um, So all of those things put together with the fact that the Kings didn't get better. So if you make the argument Oklahoma City got better, okay, you can make an argument, I guess, that Dallas got better. They're certainly playing better right now. That's fine. L.A. is the Clippers. They're just in a – that team's loaded. Like, they've always been good. They've just been a little – you know, stuff happens with them always. Sure. But now it's like coming together where it's like, holy crap, this might be the most dangerous team in the entire league. All of those things combined, and it looks – and then you don't make moves – you know, at the trade deadline, and you don't really have an impact in free agency, and Kings fans look around like, wait, did everybody get better except for us? Mm. And I think that, I think I think what we're seeing now, or what we've seen develop through the first part of this season, is kind of a manifestation of frustrations that started in free agency. When we got really hyped up about potential free agents, targets, who would fit, when ultimately... Uh, Monty and Mike and and the rest of that crew decided Harrison would fit Hmm. and they kind of went from there. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Hungry Root. Hungry Root is your partner in healthy living. It's the easiest way to get fresh, high quality groceries and simple, healthy recipes delivered to your door. Take a fun, short quiz and Hungry Root will get to know your personal health goals, what you like to eat, the kitchen appliances that you use and more. Then they'll build you a personalized cart with all of your grocery needs for the week and give you delicious recipe recommendations to put those groceries to good use. Hungry Root will recommend recipes and groceries based off of your personal taste, but each order is fully customizable. They'll they have their suggestions and they can have you choose what Ever you want. They've got fresh produce, high quality meat and seafood, pantry staples, uh, healthy snacks, sweets, ready to eat meals, and so much more. Everything from Hungry Root follows a simple standard. It's got to taste good, be quick to make, that one's my favorite, and contain whole trusted ingredients. Save hours of planning, shopping, and cooking. Hungry Root delivers food that you'll love. Right now, Hungry Root is offering Locked On Kings listeners 40% off your first delivery and free veggies for life. That's not an exaggeration. Go to HungryRoot.com slash Locked On. Get 40% off of your first delivery and your free veggies. That's HungryRoot.com slash Locked On. Don't forget to use our link so they know that we sent you. While you were saying something there, something dawned on me that I hadn't thought about before. And I think you and I, Dilo, are kind of wired the same to where I think both of us really get frustrated when we're not progressing, at least with us personally, right? We look at progression as like the expectation. We expect to continuously get better and, and learn from our mistakes and improve in our own lives and our careers and things like that. And I, I, I look at the Sacramento Kings and and kind of apply that in the same way. Like I want to see this team continuously improve. So the two steps forward, one step back or, or, or two mi- small steps forward, one gigantic step back has been like, infuriating at times this season. So let me ask you this, because I agree with you that I don't think the Kings have massively regressed by any means. And we discussed yesterday on D'Lo and KC, if the Kings make it into the playoffs, if they, they, they come out of this race in a top six spot, even though they've dropped from a third seed to the sixth seed, I'm not calling that a failure this season based off of the circumstances. That being said, simply put, like, do you think the Kings have progressed? Do you think the Kings have gotten better or are maybe better is the wrong word with what Mike is trying to accomplish and what Mike and the Kings are trying to build here? Have they taken steps towards that this season? You think? That's a good one. Um, I feel like you inadvertently asked two very different questions. Mm -hmm. Did the Kings get better? And did the Kings take steps to get to where Mike Brown wants? So let's start with, did the Kings get better? 
I don't, the answer is no. Domas is better. Yeah. Like, and that's amazing because he was really, really good last year. Domas's season, all star or not, is phenomenal. De'Aaron's ups, he, he doesn't really have ups and downs. He had a up, 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 and then like a down, and now he's kind of trending back up. So I don't want to frame it like this. This it's this roller coaster. It was like up, now it's down, now it's now it's trending back up, headed into the break. But overall, it feels like De'Aaron has gotten better. A component to Keegan Keegan Murray overall has gotten better. His defense has gotten incredible. Right. De'Aaron has gotten incredible. So uh, on, on the defensive end, he's gotten much better on the defensive end. So the answer to the question, did the Kings get better? I think is no, because it feels like Herter has been all over the place. Mm-hmm. Harrison has been all over the place. Sasha, Sasha hasn't really panned out. Uh, I really like the minutes we've gotten from Davion over the last month or so, but we didn't see Davion for the first couple of months of the season for whatever reason. So in that regard, no, the Kings didn't get better. Did they get closer to where Mike Brown wants them to be? The answer to that might be yes, mm. because, because of what we just talked about with the development of Keegan Murray on the defensive end, the, the development of De'Aaron Fox on the offensive end, and the fact that I think for Mike, if you can get through this season, I really, really believe, and I hope I'm not putting too much on this, that the a, 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 a playoff spot is important, like a series uh, is important. Mm-hmm. If they're able to secure that, whatever happens, you lose in the first round to whoever, so be it. You've got work to do this offseason, a lot of work to do this offseason to get closer to you know being a contender and being a team that makes a deep run in the playoffs. But right now, I feel like they they are just kind of they're relying on they're relying on their offense and they're relying on guys clicking together and that hasn't outside of De'Aaron and Domas there ha- that hasn't really happened a lot it's happened with Malik but you still you got to have something from Harrison you got to have a little something from Kevin Herter or Keegan Murray and too often you haven't like I was mm-hmm. frustrated that I think Harrison and Keegan combined for 14 points against Phoenix mm-hmm. and not that Harrison wasn't working out there like he was uh, not that Ke- Ke- Keegan wasn't doing stuff on the defensive end he he was, but you know the the you had a limited number of shots because of the way De'Aaron, Domas, and Malik were playing. You really had to find a way to take advantage of those against a team like Phoenix, and they couldn't. Um, but I I I I I don't think they got better this year. But I think when Mike is able to remove himself from the season when the season's over he might feel a little bit better about mm-hmm. what he has moving forward. Assuming of course he can make uh, him, his front office can make some moves for him. Let's talk about De'Aaron Fox specifically. And I want to revisit what you just said about the the front office moves too. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to that because I think that's really important. But with De'Aaron, we've, we've seen the greatness, right? We saw it at the start of the season. We saw it on the playoff stage, who knows how much better it would have been and how it would have continued had he not injured his, uh, his hand the way that he did in the playoffs. Right. So we've seen, we've seen close to, if not the top of the mountain of what De'Aaron Fox can be in this league. Are we at the point now where we kind of have to accept that the top of that mountain also comes with the climb to get there and the climb to get there is the nights like, late January, early February, where, where De'Aaron just is not, whether it's physically at a hundred percent or a hundred percent mentally in, invested into the game or willing to get downhill as much. Like I think the, the evolution of De'Aaron's three point shot has been amazing to watch. And in some ways it's also become kind of a crutch for him. And I don't blame him. The amount of times that he went down into the paint and got banged up and whacked around and not locked on the floor. Now he's like, I got a three point shot. I don't got to do that 82 times a year. I'm not going to do it 82 times a year. I'm going to sustain myself, maintain myself and avoid that contact as much as I possibly can. Plus he probably feels he's still not getting the foul calls that he deserves for his status in the league. That being said, like I, I just, the amount of years that we've seen De'Aaron, we watched his entire career here in Sacramento. We know how great he can possibly be. We also know that his competitiveness comes out in the floor when he jaws at people and he kind of has his fun. He usually does it with a smile on his face. He will not step to the podium and call guys out. You're not going to see him in the huddle screaming at anybody. That's just not who De'Aaron Fox is. That fire, it comes out in a different way 
uh, from De'Aaron. And it typically comes out on bigger stages than in the middle of a regular season type thing. Is that just who De'Aaron is and who Kings fans kind of have to accept? The De'Aaron is is maybe never going to be the 35 points per game scorer throughout the course of a regular season because he's going to have those gaps in the season where he's just not giving his all or he's just not 100% invested like he was early in the season? Or is that not fair? Um, No, I don't think Kings fans have to accept that because I actually, I, I think De'Aaron, and, and I think this is something that we forget sometimes when we cover this game, is that it, like, it's, you know, to be a 30 point per game scorer, which De'Aaron was the first like 31 games of the season or something. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a high level of output, right? Yeah. Like night after night, after night, after night, we don't pay attention to it because it's, it, I haven't, I'm, I'm going to workshop this right here on the sure. Lockdown Kings podcast. Cause I was, <laughs> I was, I was I'm, I'm trying to think of an analogy and, and, and I think Kenny would appreciate this analogy. It's the burden of not winning. Right. We talked about this all week with Kyle Shanahan. You were in Las Vegas. You watched Kyle Shanahan lose in the Super Bowl again. Hmm. There is no world in my mind, and just this is my opinion, where you can make an argument that Kyle Shanahan isn't a great coach. Mm -hmm. Like he's a he's a phenomenal coach. He's one of the best in the entire league. He's an incredible offensive mind. He took a, a quarterback in Jimmy Garoppolo to the Super Bowl. Jimmy Garoppolo is on the verge of being out of the league. That's the shoot. You saw the news with the Raiders today. He's on the verge of like he's looking for a home, right? Mm -hmm. He took the final pick of the draft and took him to the Super Bowl. Now, Brock, I believe, is a very good quarterback, and we've seen signs of that over the course of the last year and some change. But Kyle carries the burden of not winning. De'Aaron carries the burden of Sacramento. He mm -hmm. carries the burden of this franchise not winning. So when he has, you know, when he's averaging 30 points per game, you know, when his average drops, it, it becomes a, you know, a, a, a Kevin O, what's his face from the ringer tweeting, hey, what's wrong with De'Aaron Fox? There's plenty of times where Dame Lillard, through the course of his career, you could check the box score on a couple of nights. So you could watch a Portland Trailblazers game, see Dame Lillard and go, man, Dame had 12 tonight. It's weird. Dame must have had an off night. Oh, yeah, 15 tonight. That's weird. It's an off night for Dame. He averages 27. That's that's strange. Mm -hmm. But De'Aaron does it and it becomes, oh my God, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. Now his 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 scoring like dipped. His his scoring average when you break the two segments of the season up went from like 30 points per game to 22 points per game. And there was a, a slight, you know, shift in the in the in the winning percentage over those games as well. I don't have an issue though with De'Aaron's scoring going up and down i have an issue and i think it was the detroit game where it just looked like De'Aaron was not engaged that i have a problem with mm -hmm. and i think a lot of times we look at whether he's attacking the basket or, or or the you know the output in which he's scoring with i think we look at that sometimes as engagement that's probably not necessarily fair we don't know what he's seeing on the floor we don't know what he's seeing defensively and maybe we're not paying attention to what's going on in the offense around him. But Detroit, he looked like, man, I don't want to be here. I don't want to play this game. Mm. This team stinks. Mm. Let's, I think it was the night before the trade deadline, if I'm not mistaken. Let's just get this over with. And he looks so disconnected. That's the only time where I can say, I got a problem with that. Like, mm. you, you can't do that. And I'll give him credit. This Kings team, the Nuggets team, and the officials – they were disconnected on that game on Wednesday. Nobody right. wanted the all-star break to get here more than those three crews. But the difference in the game was Denver was hitting shots at the beginning and Sacramento wasn't. Then Sacramento started hitting shots and Denver didn't. And then De'Aaron sat back like, okay, got it. And when it was time to take the game over, he took it over and made sure Sacramento got out of there with a win. I need that from him on a night-to-night -night basis. It's a tall ask, but he is the only player on the team capable of doing that on a night-to-night -night basis. Malik can do it. Hmm. I don't think Malik can do it every night. And Malik has bailed De'Aaron out in, in, in a couple of games where, where he's had a rough night. I, bailed out is a strong term, but like Malik has had a, you know, a really you know, big night on nights that De'Aaron has had some bad ones. Malik was off that night. 
Domas was cooking, but still in the end, De'Aaron is the one who can take the basketball in his hands and take complete control of the game. And he did that on Wednesday, which I appreciate. And I think Kings fans, if you want to be excited about something or feel positive about something headed in to the second part of the season, it's if you get something like that for more rather than, you know, if you, if you, if you get them for a high percentage of these final 28 games of the season, I think the Kings really do have a good shot of securing that six spot because along the way, you're going to have to beat Dallas, right? You're going to, you, you got a couple of games against Dallas. You got a couple of games in Los Angeles. Like March is a huge month. They got yep. two versus LA. They got two versus Dallas. It, it, you, you, you don't really have control over new Orleans anymore. So you got to take control of those two teams and you don't play Phoenix for the last time until the final game of the season. So that could mean everything. And it could mean nothing. Like mm. there's no way to tell right now. But Dallas and LA, you've got to, you've got to, you got to take care of business in March. And if this is the version of De'Aaron Fox you're getting, you should feel pretty confident about their ability to do so. This episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. It's what brings home the winning trophy, and it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle to level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, you're guaranteed to f uh, the parts that you get are guaranteed to fit your ride every single time, or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not burning cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easier to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at eBayMotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. You ask anybody who watches the Kings, you ask anybody who covers the Kings or who pays even a little bit of attention to the Kings, you ask the Kings themselves. It's De'Aaron Fox's team. De'Aaron Fox is the guy. De'Aaron Fox is a superstar. But if you ask people who have been consistently watching the Kings like you and I, I think we would all say that when it comes to consistent output and consistently bringing it, DeMontis Sabonis has been that guy this season. Sabonis has had the best season of his career and it's not even close and this is going to be the season that he's not an all-star compared to three seasons that he's made it when he's been worse believe it or not which yeah. is just even crazy to say yeah. like uh, you you asked me a question yesterday on locked on kings and it's kind of tongue-in-cheek and you had to reiterate it so the audience didn't take it and run with it you said like why does why does uh, uh, uh mike brown hate kevin herter and it was it was like a silly question had to do with Kevin Herter's rotation. We're not going to have time to talk about that on uh, today's podcast, but definitely a conversation for, for a later day. But you said it tongue in cheek because obviously Mike Brown doesn't actually hate Kevin Herter. There's a question on the side of the screen right now. Why does the NBA hate DeMontis Sabonis? Initially, I would have thought, thought, okay, that's also kind of a tongue in cheek question. The NBA doesn't hate DeMontis Sabonis. It's, it's the fans. It's the Kevin O'Connors and the ringers and, and people that put these tier lists out and stuff. And it just, they just do not respect or understand what Sabonis is doing simply because they said that the trade from the, or with the Indiana Pacers was a bad one for the Kings and they can't just admit that they were wrong. And then you have NBA coaches not voting Demondis Sabonis in for having the best season of his career, not putting him in above Anthony Davis, not putting him in above Carl Anthony Towns, two guys that he has literally not lost against so far this season. So the question I think stands, like why does the NBA hate Demondis Sabonis? What is it that Sabonis is doing or not doing <clears throat> that doesn't make the NBA want to showcase that to the world. I'm glad they picked him for this Netflix documentary thing that they're doing. And hopefully that helps him gain some fans and gain some respect around the league when they see how great of a person he is in addition to how damn good of a basketball player he is. But Sabonis is putting up the numbers, having the games on an exciting team in the Western Conference. He checks, in my opinion, all the criteria for showcase this man. He has the European ties as well. Why does the NBA, it feel like, not want to showcase or draw attention to what Sabonis is doing? The only reason, the only, the only thing that I can think of is the fact that there's already a guy who does it. Mm. Right? You pick, you have, you have, uh, you have Shea. He's long, he's lengthy. 
He 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 is incredible on in the defensive end. He can get to the basket in two, two steps. Got strong Kevin Durant vibes, right? Mm -hmm. Young Kevin Durant. It's like, oh, all right. So we we still got KD. KD playing at a high level. You know, we got we got this we got this Shea at this guard position. He can move. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay, we got we got something there. And you start to look around. Luca is really unique, and you know, Luca is just a you know an absurd scorer, right? And they've mm -hmm. wanted Luca. Luca is great. The league has wanted him to be great. For, for a very, very long time with, with Joel and Jokic, two really different players at the same position, right? Very, very different type of players with Jokic and Sabonis. You have guys who do the same exact thing for their teams, score, rebound, facilitate the floor. Jokic does it at an MVP level. Domas does it at an all pro level. And I think the NBA looks at it like, well, we already got one of those. Let's find something else. It's like if you're clothes shopping. Oh, there's this purple King's hoodie, and there's this purple King's hoodie. It's a different logo. I already got a purple King's hoodie. I'm going to go get a black one or a white one or a gray one, or I'm going to go get a jersey. I'm going to go get something else. The only thing I can think of is that he's so close to what Nikola Jokic does they're just like, well, we already have a Nikola Jokic. Why do we have to showcase a guy who does what he does at a slightly lower level? It's the only thing I can think of. Mm -hmm. And if they were winning 60 games, it would be different. But they're not. They're a good basketball team, but they're not winning at a clip that forces you to pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I can think of. Because well, you, they drool over Jokic. I don't know, like, why aren't you drooling over Domas? Yeah. This dude is phenomenal. It's 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 funny. I always make the joke. Everybody knows how much I love Ru Russell Westbrook. Like, y'all love triple doubles until someone you don't like is getting them. Mm. Y'all loved when Luka got triple doubles or LeBron got triple doubles. Russell Westbrook did it for four seasons, and y'all just stopped caring. Mm. Y'all love triple doubles when Nikola Jokic does it, but Domas does it. You know what the highest clip of 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 anyone in the league this season? Yeah, yeah. I don't care. You only like triple doubles when a guy that you're pushing does it, mm. and that dry that drives me nuts. It mm. drives me nuts. Man, if the NBA ain't like the WWE in that sense too, every once in a while, but oh, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. They, they 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 you know they book. They booked their favorites at the top. You know, they be just, just Triple H in the early 2000s right now. That's what Nikola Jokic is, just running rough shot through everybody. Well, Sacramento's got to get uh, DeMondis Sabonis that Daniel Bryan love so he gets the attention at the at the end when it's all said and done. Well, finish you know, the story, uh, Domas. Finish the story. <laughs> we we could take this on a completely different curve. How much I would love to spend the next all 30 minutes break, baby. podcast. <laughs> yeah, really? Oh, man, there's so much going on, especially with The Rock being back. I want to host a WWE podcast so bad. But I'll wrap this Kings podcast Locked up. on WWE, question mark? I would be. I'm pitching it. I'm pitching it now. Like I just as soon as gave we're done, away. I just gave away a million dollar idea to David Block. Yeah, you did. You really did. And Work I'm, over it, the cash, pal. We're gonna host it. You and I are gonna host it. We're gonna make sure we'll wrap up the Locked On Kings podcast with this, D'Lo. You brought up the off season. You brought up the front office uh, a little bit earlier. Like it would not surprise me, and I'm I'm, I'm hoping. I'm, I'm thinking like two years from now, the Kings are firmly established, top of the Western Conference playoff team, hoping to be competing for a championship or maybe they are competing for a championship at that time and we're breaking each season down like a rung on the ladder similar to the late 90s early 2000s and that climb to the prominence of that team the first year was the like the dawning of the beam and this team's return to relevancy and a lot a lot of fun and they talked it caught the world by storm they finally got back and they they realized they had something this season was separating the real from the fake this season was you brought that group back you found out what what could actually get you there and what was just along for the ride right and i think that all depends upon this off season this upcoming off season i've said a lot this season that i i felt that the kings weren't going to do anything at the trade deadline i said that on your show back in like november I just felt like the way the roster was and the way things were shaking out, the Kings weren't really going to do anything because they wanted to get another playoff series, hopefully of context, or at the very least a regular season of context and then make decisions. 
So you've gone through an off season of very minor moves, mainly bringing the team back. Two trade deadlines of very minor moves to no moves at all. Now you're going into an off season where I still think the top of the list is keeping a guy here in Malik Monk. I still think that's priority number one going into this off season. But Kevin Herter, Harrison Barnes, Davion Mitchell, everything else around that Fox, Sabonis, Monk, Murray core that you hopefully can sustain or maintain, that's going to be question. I guess the, the last thing that I have to ask you is, is there a scenario in your mind that you feel that the Kings won't be really making some big decisions and making some big moves. I feel like this is an off season that might, like you talk about the trade, the DeMontis Sabonis trade, like determining Monty and his career. And that did to some extent that earned him the second contract. This is going to determine whether or not he's going to be a good GM or a great GM, just like the Kings are going to be a good or great team. This upcoming off season is where I feel like, all right, Monty, this is where you, you, you want to build a champion. This is where it's going to have to happen. Uh, you asked if there's a scenario where I see that that doesn't happen. The only scenario I see is if they can't find a trade partner. Um, Does he get a pass for that though? I mean, I know it takes two to tango, but you yeah, gotta initiate something. It, it, I, 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 I'm of the, like this deadline. If there was a move you wanted to make, and it wasn't there, I'm perfectly okay that you didn't make that move mm -hmm. because you have kind of minimal bargaining chips at this point. And, you know, an under discussed, you know, James brings it up a lot. We didn't discuss it today. An under discussed component to them making the playoffs is the, the, the draft pick goes to, to Atlanta, the slates wipe clean. You can trade it, you know, any and everything that you want to moving forward. Mm -hmm. They don't make the playoffs. That becomes a whole different headache. So you have a, you have, assets you have draft capital at your disposal uh and you have um attractive contracts mm. with 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 decent ball players at your disposal i i try to stall these guys out in that like i don't believe Monty's not trying right but the only scenario would be like if he just can't if he just can't get someone to engage with him there's probably a point and it's probably this off season though, to your, to your point, Matt, where he's got to get aggressive. Mm -hmm. And if he puts a trade proposal on the table for a player that he would, if there's a player that Monty and Wes and Mike really believe is going to improve this team and you put an offer out there and that team goes, eh, not quite what we were looking for. You've got to go find what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. What is it that you want? Did you want another draft pick? Okay. Here, you got take it. You, here, here's the other draft pick. Let's go. Did you want a a, a couple of second round? Like, what is, did you want a role player? Like, tell me what you want because we've if that player exists, and I don't know who that is, but if that player exists, they have to be aggressive in in going to get that player. Uh, because you're right. Like this is this will be the next defining moment for Monty McNair in this front office. Because well, we saw we saw the you know the the the, the run it back we we've seen that now. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone wants to see this anymore. Mm -hmm. You know we want to see it through the season. We want it to to, to 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 go well, but let's let's start thinking about what's next. Right, and we're all thinking about that one step at a time. Though what's next is a really really competitive playoff race here in the Western Conference. Of course, throughout that race, in addition to Locked On Kings, D'Lo and KC, Monday through Friday. Uh, uh, noon to four o'clock every single weekday. They'll have you covered throughout that entire race and then some over there. So check that show out if you're not already. Uh, D'Lo, appreciate you making the time before going and hopping on for four hours of D'Lo and KC. You just extended your workday by 30 to 45 minutes for me, and I appreciate that, my man. So thanks for doing that. Uh, have a great, great show. Thanks for coming on, and we'll uh, we'll do it again soon. We'll have you back on probably before this race is done with. Oh, man, I, I love that. I appreciate you. Thanks, Matt.